Hi, algebra friends. Welcome to chapter nine, rational expressions. We are going to begin chapter nine with simplifying rational expressions. Uh, but first, a couple of reminders. A rational number, something you should have seen in a previous algebra class. Um, a rational number is any number that can be written in the form p over q or as a fraction, as long as p and q are integers. So they're not decimals, they're not radicals. A uh, reminder what an integer is. An integer is all our counting numbers. Zero, one, two, three, forever. And then they're negative counterparts. So negative one, negative two, um, all the way to negative infinity. Examples of rational numbers would be three sevenths, negative eight, Fifteenths. Four is a rational number because four can be written as a fraction. We can write it for one example. We can write it as four over one. We could write it as eight over two. There's infinitely made new ways to write four. Zero is a rational number because zero is just zero over any non-zero number. Finite decimals can be written as um, Fractions, so this would be 46 hundredths, not reduced, but we could reduce it, right? Um, even repeating decimals, we did three, three, three repeating. Remember, that's just one third. So repeating decimals also are rational numbers. Examples of irrational numbers are numbers are like pi. There is no fractional equivalent for pi, so we call it an irrational or a not rational number. Um, radicals that can't be simplified for example, are not rational. Uh, e is a number that if you pop it in your calculator, you look over down the left side above the LN button, E is about equal to 2.718. It's another one of those numbers like pi that just kept appearing in applications, so mathematicians assigned it a letter. So those are our rational numbers. Today we are talking about rational expressions. A rational expression is, instead of a ratio of integers, it is a, a ratio of polynomials. So in other words, we'll have a fraction, and in the top we'll have a polynomial. So we'll have one polynomial on the top, we'll have one on the bottom. polynomial on the top, a polynomial on the bottom. What's a polynomial? Well, if you go to see chapter five in your text, it'll give you a reminder of polynomials. So examples of polynomials will be something like, all our quadratics are polynomials. Um, any linear equation, is a polynomial, negative six x to the 10th plus four x cubed minus eight x plus seven is a polynomial. What we look for to see if something's a polynomial or not is the power on the variable. All, all the powers on the variables have to be non-negative integers. So this is a two, that's a one, this is an example of a polynomial. Here we have a power of one, we don't see it, but we would call that a first degree polynomial. This guy would be a 10th degree polynomial. We have the powers 10, 3, 1. Technically, there's a zero here. Examples of non-polynomials would be things like radicals, where the variable's under the radical, so the square root of x plus 5. Because technically, remember, that's equivalent to x to the 1 half power plus 5. And powers and polynomials cannot be fractions. If we had powers in denominators, this part of it passes um, the definition of a polynomial, but this is what makes it a problem right here. Because remember, that's equivalent to four x to the negative two power. And the powers on all the variables when put in standard form has to be uh, non-negative integers. So here's the problem right there. That's what makes it not a polynomial. This fractional power makes it not a polynomial. So we have these nice, well-behaved expressions where we have a polynomial on the top and a polynomial on the bottom. So examples of some rational expressions would be like 
let's see. Let's do x squared minus four over x plus three. It's a second degree polynomial over a first degree polynomial. We could have just a constant over x squared minus eight x plus 10. So constants are polynomials. The power in the variable is technically zero there. We could have higher degrees. All over anything higher, we could do x to the 10 plus x squared. That would be an example of a polynomial, a fifth degree polynomial over a 10th degree polynomial. So if you're not sure, again, you're not quite thinking or remembering what polynomials are, be sure to come by and ask questions or stick around at the end of class. Um, reminder, expressions versus equations. What's the difference between an expression and an equation? Well, an equation has an equal sign. Expressions do not. Right, unless you insert it, an expression um, is just an expression. What we do with an expression is we simplify, we factor, we evaluate. So for example, I could just say x plus seven. That is an expression. We have no idea what to do with that. We would have to be given further instructions. Are we setting that equal to zero? Are we evaluating it for x equals a particular value of a number? Um, we're an equation, we solve equations. So for example, we might have x plus seven, but we would have the additional information that it equals something, and then we would solve it and would say x equals four. Here, what are we gonna do? I could say evaluate it for x equals 10, and then you would say 10 plus seven equals 17, and that would be your final answer. So this is what we're going to do today in this lecture. We're going to look at expressions, we're going to simplify, factor, and evaluate. Later in the chapter, we will solve rational equations. All right, let's look at this guy. Suppose we had the expression x plus one over x squared minus nine. Now we have no idea what that equals, but I'm gonna tell you to do some things with it. I said evaluate for x equals zero, one, negative one, and three. So we have four separate problems here. If x equals zero, we put in zero everywhere we see x, we get zero plus one, all over zero squared minus nine. We simplify, we get one over negative nine, which you could leave it one over negative nine, or you could bring the negative out front and call it negative one ninth. If x was one, well, we would get one plus one everywhere we see x. We're gonna replace x with a one instead, minus nine, so it'd be one squared minus nine in the denominator. That becomes two over negative eight. Make sure you simplify all um, results. It's always expected we will simplify. Two over eight is equivalent to one over four. So my final answer is negative one fourth. All right, let's see what happens if x was equal to negative one. We get negative one plus one. Now be really careful in the denominator here because we're squaring that entire value of x, including the negative sign. So it's really important that you remember to square the one along with the negative. If you are putting this in your calculator, which hopefully you don't need to do that, um, but if you do, make sure you square the negative, use the parentheses. So the denominator is going to become one minus nine. The numerator is just zero. So that's zero over negative eight and zero over any non-zero constant is zero. So this expression evaluated at negative one is zero. Now zeros in the numerator are okay zeros in the denominator or not. We do not have zero in the denominator, so we can just call that value zero. All right, let's plug in x equals three. We get three plus one in the numerator, and we get three squared minus nine in the denominator, so that's four over zero. All right, well, that, this is a problem. Four over zero does not have a value. We call it undefined. We can't divide by zero.
and Siri has a very cool explanation. So if you're kind of bored, um, hit Siri on your phone and ask why you can't divide by zero. Right. When we have a rational expression and we evaluate it at some point and that point produces a zero in the denominator, we call that value a restricted value for that expression. That means there's a restriction, we can't use it in that expression. So we call x equals three a restricted value for this expression. That is x equals three is not allowed to be used as an input. To find the restricted values for any expression, what we do is we look closely at the denominator and identify what would make the denominator zero. So we would find the values of the input that would produce a zero in the denominator. So when we're looking for the restricted values, we're looking for the real zeros of the denominator. Right, the zeros, just a friendly reminder, zeros are inputs that produce an output of zero. So let's find all the restricted values for this expression. To find the restricted values of an expression, you set the denominator equal to zero. So the restricted values, I'll abbreviate them RVs, restricted values set the denominator equal to zero, and then use any and all techniques that we have done in the past to solve this. So you may want to use the square root property here. Well, x squared equals nine which means x is equal to the positive or negative square root of nine. Don't forget the negative counterpart, which means x is equal to positive or negative three. Or we could have done x squared minus nine equals zero and notice that this is the difference of squares. x squared minus nine factors nicely. This is just x minus three times x plus three. So this factor would say x equals three is one solution. This factor would say x equals negative three is the other solution. Right. So therefore, we say three and negative three are the zeros of the denominator x squared minus nine. So three and negative three are the restricted values. for this given expression. We can put in any other number in the world except for three and negative three. So whatever makes the denominator zero, whatever numerical values are the zeros of the denominator, are called the restricted values of that rational expression. This doesn't work just for rational expressions. Any expression that has a, a variable in the denominator, whatever would make that denominator zero is a restricted value for that expression. So what would the restricted values be for the expression x squared minus 4x plus 7 over x minus 10? Well, this is quite simple. The restricted value, we only have one here. We set the denominator equal to zero and seeing this is a linear equation, the only restricted value is x equals 10. So the only restricted value for this expression is x equals 10. That means we can use any number as an input into this expression except for negative 10. I'm sorry, except for just positive 10, because if we put positive 10, it produces um, a zero in the denominator. Now, just a friendly reminder what a do domain is. The domain for any expression is the allowable set of inputs. So for this guy, for this expression, we can put in anything but 10. So we would say the domain is any real number except x equals
equals 10. So the notation, well, every real number except for 10, if we look at a number line, on the number line, here's 10, for example, we can put in everything to the left of 10, everything to the right of 10, and we use an open circle to indicate that we can't use 10, but we can use everything to the right or the left of 10. Interval notation. Well, if we're trying to write this domain in interval notation, what we do is keep in mind what this left arrow on the number line means. That means negative infinity. The right arrow means positive infinity. So if we go left to right, it starts at negative infinity. We go all the way up, nothing exciting happens until we hit 10. This open circle corresponds to the notation parenthesis. We always put parentheses around infinity. So this interval from negative 10 to infinity, I'm sorry, negative infinity to 10, does not contain the value 10. That's what that open parenthesis means. That represents all numbers to the left of 10. This part of it, of the domain, any number to the right of 10, would be from 10 all the way to infinity. And we usually use this called the union symbol just to connect the two. I prefer set notation in upper level math. We tend to use this notation. This is a heck of a lot easier than the, all the others that we just wrote. We use the curly brackets. You put the variable at the start of the curly brackets and either use a colon here or a straight line. And then you make some sort of description after the straight line about the variable. So this tells me that the domain can be any value of x as long as x doesn't equal 10. So here is this means this, and that means that. This means this, and that means that. This is interval notation. And this is set notation. Alex won't ever ask you to put in set notation, but you may see interval notation. And this is just numerical. This is graphically. All right, so that all being said, let's find the restricted values for this expression. And then with that information, determine the domain. So the restricted values, we set the denominator equal to zero, and we use anything we've learned in previous classes to solve this. Now notice this is a quadratic equation. To solve a quadratic equation, we can factor, we can use the AC method, we can complete the square. Hopefully you notice at this point in the game that this factors nicely. This is just x minus three and x minus two. Be careful with sixes and fives because it could also be six and one um, or one and six, but then it wouldn't give us the inners and the outers that we needed. So if we factor this, we get the solutions to this quadratic equation to be x equals three and x equals two. So therefore, the restricted values are x equals, I'm just going to put 2 first because it comes before 3, x equals 2 and 3. Thus, the domain is the domain of this expression is all real numbers. You can put in any real number except two or three. So how do we write that in math notation? Because we don't want to write all those words anymore. So on a number line, here is two. I'm just putting it anywhere. Here is three. So it can be any number to the left of two all the way to negative infinity. It can be any number between two and three and any number to the right of three all the way to positive infinity. And we put open circles above the numbers that we're not allowed to have in our domain. Now my interval notation my interval notation I go from negative infinity so I go left to right all the way up to 2. So this interval represents all the numbers to the left of 2. Now be careful we have two restricted values this time so we have all the numbers to the left of 2 all the numbers between 2 and 3. So that would be the open interval from 2 to 3. That represents all those numbers in there. And then all the numbers to the right of 3 would be from 3 to infinity. So notice left to right, negative infinity to 2, and then from 2 to 3, 
and then from three to infinity. And we use what we call the union symbol just to mathematically collect, connect to them. Union symbol in math means or, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so it says that X can be any number between negative infinity and two, or a number between two and three, or a number between three and infinity. Set notation. Again, Alex doesn't tend to use this. Your book may use it. Um, we would say curly bracket and we would say our variable is X. And then we would say something about X afterwards to make it clear what we're allowed to use and not use. So what we um, have to say is that we can use anything except for two or three. So X cannot be two and it not, cannot be three. Right, so this time we've determined the restricted values and from that information we determined the domain. Sometimes we are just asked to find the domain. So we should be able to find the domain with the understanding that we have to find the restricted values first to answer that question. For example, what if I said determine the domain of this function? Well, we need to find the restricted values first. Even though it didn't tell us to, it's going to assume that we know that. So let's find the restricted values first. We find the restricted values by setting the denominator equal to zero because the restricted values are the values that would make the denominator of this expression zero and we're not allowed to have zeros in the denominator. So now you can either use the AC method um, or the quadratic formula to, to do this. I see that this factors. So however you wanna do it, as long as you do it correctly, we should get the same result. This has to be 2x and x if it factors. Now it has to be three and one here. One has to be positive and one has to be negative because the only two numbers that I can multiply together in the last places to get the last number is one and three. So is it one and three or is it three and one? One has to be positive and one has to be negative. So I'm gonna do plus three minus one. Now my guesses are good because I'm an ex very experienced at this. So you might have to guess and check, but don't forget to always check. Does the product of the first give me the first? Yes, 2x squared times x is 2, I'm sorry, 2x times x is 2x squared. Does the product of the last give me negative 3? 3 and negative 1, yes, is negative 3. Do the inners and the outers together just give me 1x? Well, I have 3x's on the inside, I have minus 2x's on the outside for 1x in the middle. Now we have to remember we're factoring in order to find the solutions to the quadratic equation um, by setting the denominator equal to zero. So two X plus three equals zero. We subtract three and divide by two. So X would be negative three halves. So negative three halves would make this denominator zero. I don't care what it does to the numerator. We have no restrictions in the numerator. Or the other factor X minus one equals zero. So X equals one. So those are my restricted values. Therefore, my restricted values. Now, that's not what the question was. X equals negative 3 halves and 1. Now, be careful. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I see students make is they find the restricted value, and then they use that to answer the question, what is the domain? The domain and the restricted values are literally complete opposites of each other. Whatever the restricted values are, that's what the domain is not. So these are the restricted values. So the domain is any value of x as long as x does not equal negative 3 halves or 1. So that's what I'm going to write instead of saying it from now on. So x cannot be negative 3 halves or 1. If we look on a number line, and often number lines help us to create the interval notation, so negative 3 halves is to the left of 1 on my number line. So I'm going to put those two numbers on my number line. So I need all numbers to the left of negative 3 halves, all numbers in between negative 3 halves and 1, and all numbers to the right of 1. We're not allowed to use three negative 3 halves. We're not allowed to use 1. So therefore, the domain in interval notation would be keeping in mind your left arrow, is symbolic for negative infinity. Your right arrow is symbolic for positive infinity. So this is gonna go negative infinity to negative three halves. This is all the numbers to the left of negative three halves. Now I wanna represent all the numbers between negative three halves and one. This interval represents all these numbers between negative three halves and one. And then all the numbers to the right of one, one to infinity. I use union symbols.
So this would be my answer. So be careful. You have to use the restricted values in order to find the domain. So this would be the answer to the question. All right, so first things, restricted values, determining the domains. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about solving rational expressions. We're gonna take something you already know how to do and take it to the next level. All right, what if you were asked to solve this little itty bitty rational equation? I'm not sorry, simplify this little itty bitty rational equation. How would you simplify 15 over 40? Well, let's think. Hopefully you're thinking to yourself, does 15 and 40 have any common factors? Because we would take the common factor out of the numerator and the denominator. And I know that 15 and 40 are both divisible by five. So in my mind, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna call 15 five times three, and I'm going to call 40 five times eight. And once I do that, I can cross off this common factor, right? We can only cross off common factors in numerators and denominators, and then we just keep what's left, 3 eighths, and we ask ourselves, does 3 and 8 have any common factors? Well, we know the answer to that is no, so therefore, 15 over 40 simplified is 3 over 8. All right, caution, don't do this. If you had 15 over 40, could we do this? Could we do 5 plus 10? over five plus 35? Well, of course we could, that's the same thing. Could we then do this and call this 10 over 35? No, do not do this. Here, in this instance, five, is a common term here and we can't simplify common terms. So keep that in mind, we can't have something separated by addition or subtraction and cross it off with something in the numerator and in the denominator. It has to be a factor, so it has to be able to be pulled out. All right, well, we are in algebra, so with, this is arithmetic, it only involves numbers. So now we're gonna do this, but we're gonna introduce variables to complicate the problem. So what if I asked you to simplify the rational expression two over six x minus 10? Well, you have to ask yourself, does two and six x minus 10 have any common factors? Well, notice we can write two as two times one, and we can pull a common factor of two out of the denominator. If I pull two out of the denominator, well, what would be left? Well, if we take the two away from six x, we're left with three x's. And then we take the, keep the um, operator subtraction and take the two out of the 10. The denominator becomes two times three x minus five. So now we can cross off the common factor of two and we can call this one over three x minus five. So therefore, two over six x minus 10 simplified is one over three x minus five. What would be restricted value for this? Didn't ask, but we're gonna do it anyway. This has one restricted value. Well, set the denominator equal to zero. Solve for x, we get x equals five thirds. So we can put in this expression and in the original. Even simplified expressions have the same restricted values as the original. Technically, we should determine the restricted values before we simplify. All right, so let's simplify this guy. This is a little bit trickier. 2x plus 2 all over 8x squared plus 8x. All right, well, the only thing that two X and two share, so we're gonna look at how what, how can we can turn the sum, in a different, uh, the sum or a difference into a product? Well, we can factor a two out. We take two out, we're left with X plus one in the numerator. 
And then maybe perhaps the denominator will have a common factor of two. And if we look, we're like, oh, as a matter of fact, it does. So let's completely factor the denominator. I'm gonna pull out an eight and an X. So pull out, as we do with all our factoring, pull out our greatest common factor. Our greatest common factor is 8x. When we pull 8x out, we're left with 1x here, plus, and then when we take the whole 8x away from here, we're left with our placeholder of 1. Now, in algebra, factors can be sums or differences. So as long as we have a parenthesis in closing it, so this is the entire factor x plus 1. This is another entire factor x plus 1. So we can eliminate that entire factor x plus 1 because it's 2 times something over 8x times the same thing. So we can cancel out those identical factors. And then what we're left with is 2 over 8x. Now remember, we always have to carry the work all the way through to the end. If we're going to simplify this expression, we have to consider simplifying it. We actually, not consider, we have to actually simplify it to the very, very end. What do I mean by that? Well, does 2 and x have any common factors? 2 and 8x have any common factors? Well, they do. 2 is just 2 times 1, and we can pull the 2 out of the bottom and call 8x 2 times 4x, cross off the common factor of 2, and this simplifies nicely down to 1 over 4x. So if I wanted to find, that would be my final answer. Here, I'll underline my final answer here. If I wanted to find the restricted values, the restricted values, if we look here, it looks as if the only restricted value is zero, but you have to determine the restricted value before you simplify completely. So we're gonna take eight x squared plus eight x, and you take the original denominator and you set that equal to zero. I pull out the common factor of eight x. I'm left with eight x times x plus one. Now this factor says, x equals zero would give, make the denominator zero and that's that guy, but be careful here x equals negative 1 would be the other restricted value. So determine restricted values before we simplify. Okay, it's not an option. The restricted values for the original expression 2x plus 2 all over 8x squared plus 8x are x equals 0 and negative 1. I know that wasn't part of the question, but we can never do too many of these. So it's really super important that when you're given a rational expression, or even a rational function. Rational function is just a rational expression with the second variable introduced, the output variable of y or f of x. So it is very, very, very important that given a rational expression or a rational function, you determine the domain before you simplify. All right, determine the restricted values in the domain for this rational function and then simplify. So let's first look for the restricted values. We're going to set the denominator equal to zero. Now for the sake of this section, these denominators typically factor nicely, so keep that in mind. This is just x minus two. X minus six, does that work? Product of the first, whoops, be careful. Don't change the problem. It's x squared minus 8x plus 12. So x squared, product of the first, product of the last is plus 12, and then my minus 2x is from the inners and minus 6x is from the outers give me negative 8x. So therefore, my restricted values are 2 and 6. So therefore, the domain is equal to the set of all x, as long as x does not equal two or six. Interval notation, everything to the left of two, all the numbers between two and six, and all of the numbers to the right of six. And we connect those with what we call the union symbol. So there's the restricted values, there's the domain. Now let's simplify. So we have x minus 6 all over x squared 
minus 8x plus 12. To simplify a rational expression, you factor the entire numerator and denominator. Now, x minus 6 is a prime expression. We can't simplify the numerator, but we or factor the numerator, but we know that the denominator factors nicely into x minus 2 and x minus 6. Now, we can, if it helps you to see what's going on here, we can insert parentheses right here. Technically, there is a common factor of 1, and that may be helpful for you here because x minus 6 is equivalent to 1 times x minus 6. Now we can cross off this entire factor parentheses and all of x minus 6 and get the simplified version of this expression, 1 over x minus 2. That would be my final answer. Now notice my restricted values are 2 and 6. If we look at the simplified expression, we still can't put 2 in, but we can put 6 into the simplified expression. We would get 1 over negative 4 which is an allowable output for the restricted, um, it is it for the simplified version of this rational expression. Um, but still, the restricted values are still two and six. We determine the restricted values of the original expression, regardless of what happens once we simplify. So there's the domain, there is my simplified expression. All right, let's do one more of these. You'll notice that this problem is very similar to the previous one. The denominator is exactly the same, but notice that the subtraction is um, uh, switched in the numerator. Now notice here, it didn't ask for the restricted values or the domain, so I'm not going to do that. So the key here is to factor everything. All right, I'm just gonna leave the, uh, the numerator as is, but I'll factor the denominator. And again, we get x minus two x minus 6. Hmm. So these almost look the same. All right, now remember, 6 minus x is not the same as x minus 6. In algebra, we're not allowed to switch the order in which we subtract without changing the value of the expression. So these are not the same, but they're almost this is the same. So I'm not sure if you remember, we talked about this um, when we were doing, um, what were we doing, completing, nope, we were doing grouping when we factored by grouping. So reminder, we talked about the polynomial opposite property. So the polynomial opposite property is a little trick we can use in algebra that's very convenient if we would like to reverse the order in which we subtract. So it's the trick is if, because all we would have to do is switch this order of subtraction in order to cancel it out with that factor in the denominator. The trick is anytime you want to switch the order in which you subtract, well, you can't just switch it, but we can pull out a factor of negative one. So a minus b is equivalent to negative 1 times the factor b minus a. So for example, I claim that 6 minus x is exactly the same as negative 1 times x minus 6. And let's just check. Negative 1 times x minus 6. If we distribute, we get negative x, and then negative 1 times negative 6 becomes plus 6. And that's the same as 6 minus x. So, anytime we have a factor that almost looks the same, except the subtraction is reversed, the trick is to use the polynomial's opposite property in order to reverse the subtraction and then cross out the common factors. So, we are going to call 6 minus x negative 1 times x minus 6 all over x minus 2 times x minus 6. Now we can cross off this common factor of x minus 6 along with the parentheses, and this will be negative 1 over x minus 2. All right, so have fun with this. Do lots of problems and get lots of practice. I'll see you in section 9-2.